I'm Matthew Messelson. Uh, I teach genetics at Harvard University. I've been there since February of 1961. Before that, I was at Caltech, where I was an undergraduate, a graduate student, a postdoc, and then I became an assistant professor, and then I came to Harvard. My name is Mark Potashny. I am now in New York at the Sloan Kettering Institute. I was for many years at Harvard, and it started in 1961 when I followed Matt as his first Harvard graduate student. I noticed that soon after we got to Harvard, Matt was teaching classical genetics. And that has nothing to do with his background or some of the things he's most famous for. So I'm curious, why were you teaching genetics? Well, you're right. I was in chemistry at Caltech, and there were nine professors of genetics in the biology department at Caltech, and I never took a course from any of them. But when I got to Harvard, the man who had been teaching genetics said he didn't want to do it anymore. And so the chairman of the department, Carol Williams, said, you're the new man, you teach genetics. And I was glad to do that because I realized I knew nothing about it and I should learn about it. And the best way to learn something is to teach it. It was wonderful. And I started using a marvelous book by Harold Whitehouse, which takes an historical approach to teaching genetics. And I think that was a very lucky thing because I learned more from the, his approach of how things happen, not just what they were. So um, my question was how this might have influenced what then happened in later years, what's happening now, for example, in your scientific well, life. I read a paper by a man named Turner called Why Does the Genome Not Congeal? I'd never thought about this before, but he was asking why when you've got a nice set of genes, doesn't it stay that way? Why is it always mixing up by crossing over genetic recombination? Mm -hmm. so, so, if you, so, so you need sex, of course to have this process of recombination. Yes, the genome would just reproduce itself mm -hmm. as it is, except for something called gene conversion mm -hmm. and other losses and gains. And this problem of why sex seems to be essential for long-term success in evolution has been called the queen of biological problems. And uh, one day I was visiting a friend, Evelyn Hutchison, and I asked him, why does sex exist? And he said, well, you know about the deloid rotifers. These are little aquatic invertebrates, and only females are known. There's no clear evidence that anyone has ever seen a male. Explain to me again, how would you know if you'd seen a male? Because there are related creatures called mm -hmm. monogonot rotifers, and we know what those males look like. They're very small. They also, you would expect mating, you'd see them doing that. You'd expect to isolate sperm from the body of the male. So there are various ways you could tell if you had a male to mm -hmm. look at. Now, how long have people been looking for male? Well, uh, Rodifer was <laughs> first discovered by Leeuwenhoek. And the first report was, I think, in the late 1700s. They're little teeny things, though with his marvelous one-lens microscope, he was able to see them. It seemed, therefore, that maybe if you could understand how a group of organisms could have thrived for maybe millions of years, if they really were asexual, maybe by finding out how they can manage that way, you would have a, a new kind of answer to why sex exists. But it turns out that although we mistakenly interpreted data years ago as supporting their asexuality, what I most recently published just this June, is there is some kind of sexuality. That's I a good thing about science. You <laughs> hope that sooner or later <laughs> somebody will figure will out. Come yeah. out. It's a little abstract and difficult a subject, but can you explain in basic terms what you've now found that makes you think there is? It's easy. Imagine you went into some big city and you took two people at random. And people are diploids, that is we have two copies of every gene. So you have two copies of a given hemoglobin gene. Yes. Let's call them red and blue. Mm -hmm. And let's say I have two copies, let's call them green and blue. Well why do you and I both have the same copy of a gene? We mm -hmm. must have inherited it. Mm -hmm. from some ancestor. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're brothers, or maybe we're descendants of brothers. What's implied there is that otherwise, just as um, red differentiated from blue by uh, natural events, mutations and so on, yes. there, so then there's no reason why a blue guy should have snuck back into these two individuals if they were coming from 
asexual populations. Yeah, because it's very unlikely the gene would evolve and evolve, and then go backwards and evolve to what it had been a long time ago. So uh, how does the sex happen in these forbidding animals? I imagine that it happens by the way it happens in their close relatives, the monogonot rotifers. That males are produced sporadically. Even with the monogonot rotifers, there are quite a few species for which no male has ever been seen. But under certain conditions, they produce males. So are you going to pursue this? What I'm thinking of doing is trying to put these rotifers that we have studied together under various combinations of light, additives, population density, and see if I can find conditions under which males appear. So for students of life, what's the bottom line in all this? Well, I think the bottom line is, first of all, that the deloid rotifers engage under conditions not yet known in some form of sexual reproduction. Well, just to make this point clear, what you found <clears throat> is based or is contained in the nature of the DNA sequences. Yes. Of these, when you said there were these red and blue genes, you're referring to their sequences. So yes. this wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago or something. It's a very sophisticated analysis of, based on we DNA, had the sequence genes. DNA sequencing. That's right. And yet no one has sequenced the whole genome. Is that right? No, there or is. And there was claim that this showed evidence that they had evolved without meiosis. Mm -hmm. And that's because there was evidence that there are no two chromosomes that are homologous to each other. And without homology, chromosomes can't pair. Ah. And standard meiosis requires chromosome pairing. How does this relate to your ah. conclusion? Well, we saw that in the deloid rotifers, there were highly diverged gene copies. And my hypothesis in starting this work was that if there's no sex at all and very little gene conversion, then the different parts of the genome don't have anything to do with each other. They will evolve independently as though the different parts were on different planets in the solar system. And therefore, homologous genes, initially kept homologous by drift in sexual creatures, uh, would diverge more and more and more. Well, we found that, genes that were very different from hmm. each other, because the deloids are tetraploids. There's four copies of many genes, and we didn't see all four. If suddenly your whole genome should just duplicate, so you've mm -hmm. got twice as many of everything. Mm -hmm. And then as great time goes on, they begin to diverge from each other. So if we looked at your genome, we may not realize that your very far distant ancestors were polyploids. And this idea that animals came from polyploids was started, so far as I know, with Susumu Ono. What He's, was his basic point? His basic his point? point was that nearly all genomes, as we see them today, had arisen from ancient duplications, which then uh. lost some genes, mm -hmm. rearranged, making it very hard to see that it was a simple duplication a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting reason why we think they have to have sex. And it comes from an observation from Mike Lynch's lab. The idea is this, that in any big diploid population, we harbor, let's say people, a lot of recessive deleterious mutations. But now if there's gene conversion, half the time, the nasty mutation will become homozygous, and you'll, become, you'll be mm -hmm. sick, mm -hmm. maybe especially in the or wild, yeah. where the competition is, is, is extreme. So the idea is that if you wait long enough, without any sex and only gene conversion, you lose your heterozygosity. And in doing so, you'll express now a lot of the deleterious mutations mm -hmm. you've got, because they will mm -hmm. have become homozygous. Okay. Unless there's outcrossing. And outcrossing restores your heterozygosity, mm -hmm. and you can keep going. That's mm -hmm. the reason we think it's essential to have sex for deloid rotifers. Mm -hmm. We means Anna Signorovich, who came from Yale and had done similar experiments with things called placozoa, and uh, Eugene uh, Gladyshov, a former graduate student, and uh, Jay Herr, a former graduate student. I'm not sure that this is generally appreciated. Of course, it's I don't. It's not. Gene conversion exposes nasty <laughs> recessives, and the line dies out. <laughs> it's a new idea. I don't think anyone had proposed this, and neither did Lynch's lab, as a basis for, why, for one of the reasons why sex exists. So this seems a long way from uh, what I first knew you about, your famous experiment involving DNA replication. And I recently heard, much to my astonishment, that the cesium chloride gradient, which you have to explain, equilibrium gradient, um, 
which you invented and developed and so on, you actually discovered by accident. Completely. By okay, accident. Can, can you explain the whole scene there? Yes, let me back up a little. So I was in chemistry at Caltech as a graduate student of Linus Pauling, mm -hmm. but I wanted to find some way to get into biology because I was always interested in it. I wanted, my ultimate target was always to try to explain how you could have a living thing made out of ordinary atoms. But why would you have gone to study with Pauling then? You did x-ray diffraction. Because I figured there. out you need to know the structure of molecules to figure out how, how they could be alive. Hmm. You need to know the architecture. Mm -hmm. But so the x-ray problem you did was on a small molecule. A very small molecule. Mm -hmm. Two amid, amid, amid groups. Anyway, so I went to see Max Delbert because he was a physicist but doing biology. And he had a fearsome reputation mm -hmm. that anybody who said anything wrong, he'd jump on him. He, was a he great must have skeptic. done a lot of jumping. Oh, there was a graduate student named Charlie Steinberg. Ah, yes. and whether this is true or not, the story is Charlie's walking down the hall looking really depressed. Uh -huh. And Jean Weigel, another scientist at Caltech, sees Charlie and says, Charlie, you look terrible. What's happened? And Charlie says, I told Max my hypothesis, and he accepted it. Ah, <laughs> he knew he was wrong. <laughs> well, but Max was really a deep thinker. Anyway, I went to see, for the first time ever, Max Delbert. Uh, who was a wonderful man. He was in no way a power seeker. He had a little tiny office. Anyway, the first thing he said is, what do you think of these new papers by Watson and Crick? And I said, I'd never heard of them. <laughs> so he got out of his chair and he reached, he had a stack of these reprints that Jim had sent him, and he threw them at me. And they went fluttering down onto the floor and he yelled at me. He said, read these and don't come back till you have. Well, I heard come back. <laughs> so I read these papers. I went back, and he told me that he didn't believe the semi-conservative replication that Francis and Jim had proposed. Believe, Explain what semi-conservative okay, replication is. Okay, so they proposed that the double helix unwinds, the DNA double helix unwinds, and on the two separate strands are deposited somehow nucleotides according to the base pairing rules, A with T and G with C, and you make two new duplexes that are copies of the original one. Each of the two new duplexes has one strand from the old and one new strand, so mm -hmm. it's not completely conservative. So there were three models that Max talked about. One is that model, call it semi-conservative. Another is that by some magic, a DNA duplex sits here and organizes the creation of an identical one next to it. Don't ask how, mm -hmm. but it would be called conservative because mm -hmm. the old one, generation after generation, is stays intact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's dispersive, where you break it into pieces. This was Max's argument. For semi-conservative replication, without making any breaks, you have to rotate the mm -hmm. parent double helix. And if it's very long, it has to deal with a lot of viscous drag. Mm -hmm. And the energy required for that is prohibitive. Mm -hmm. There was but, a lot of argument about yeah, but, but this. Yeah, but Cy Leventhal right, said that, no, it's not a big problem, but he didn't know how long DNA molecules were. Oh, well, in those days, we didn't know how long they were. Maybe they were protein linkers. Maybe. Just explain that when you isolate DNA, you typically break it just because it's, it's so fragile. It's so fragile that you break it. John Cairn showed by the simple expedient of gently opening up an E. coli cell and looking under the electron microscope at the DNA molecule and saw that it's just one big circle a millimeter long. John was first at Caltech with us. He was the one who washed the dishes in the house where Frank Stahl and Jan Drake and Howard Temin and I lived. Oh, yeah. John was the dishwasher, but he didn't live there. He didn't want to live with us. Oh. Just <laughs> ate dinner with us. Anyway, so uh, really started with Max proposing to me that the semi-conservative was wrong. So how are you going to test it? So it's a tribute to how strong a personality and an intellect Max was, that you took this as a challenge. Yes. Maybe I should have said it's nonsense, Max, forget it. Mm -hmm. But I... <laughs> he didn't dare. <laughs> Besides, I took it as a challenge also because I knew how to find out. And that's because Jacques Monod had come to give a lecture ah, yes. at Caltech yes. about a year before. Just before they found out that in... So when you add lactose to growing bacteria, they make an enzyme that eats the lactose, beta-galactosidase. So at that time, it was possible that all the lactose does is some little tweak on the pre-existing enzyme molecule that makes it active, because mm -hmm. all people were measuring was activity. Mm -hmm. Monod proposed to find out whether it's de novo synthesis or pre-existing enzyme that just needs to get tweaked, mm -hmm. that we add the lactose or the inducer 
and see if the osmotic strength <laughs> of what's inside the bacteria would go up. Because when you make a lot of new macromolecules inside of a container, water has to come in. I thought this is an absolutely terrible idea. Uh -huh. you know, how do we know the bacterial membrane may have holes? It was just terrible. Mm. But I had taken a course from Linus Pauling, I was taking it at the time, on the nature of the chemical bond, and we were talking a lot about hydrogen bonds and deuterium bonds. Deuterium is the heavy isotope of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. has an extra neutron in the nucleus of the atom. So immediately I thought the way to do this is you grow those bacteria in heavy water, because I knew then that you could grow bacteria in heavy water because it was in the literature. And then you spin them down and put them in light water and add the inducer. So now if the enzyme was already there before you made the change, so spin them down. it would be heavy. So your idea was that you would have uh, enzyme molecules that in one case would have deuterium and the other case wouldn't and they would have different densities. Yes, yes. Because their volume is the same, there's no chemical difference. No chemical but one of them. So, so then you layer the figure stuff out how you get the different densities. on the top of a sucrose gradient, which is made manually. And you centrifuge and centrifuge mm -hmm. and then look to see where the enzyme activity is. So I went to see Linus Pauling and he must have said something like, very nice idea, Matt, finish your x-ray crystallography. <laughs> And uh, that was what I was going to do, till I heard Max. And then it, immediately I thought, ah, oh, the way to solve that problem is by this same method. The, the daughter DNA should be, uh, in one case, if it's semi-conservative, after one generation, everything should have one light strand and one heavy strand. If there's conservative, after one generation, you'd have one heavy one and one completely light one. And if it's light. dispersive, you might get a schmear. As Jim's so, so just to make it clear, this beta-galactosidase idea was just a theoretical No idea. one ever did that. No one ever did it. Yeah. No. They figured out by a completely other experiment yeah. the following year in Paris. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Jim asked me, Jim Watson had spent the, that year at Caltech. And I lived at the Athenaeum and so did Jim. And we'd go there before dinner and sit and talk. This, what year was this? Well, this was the very after year, 1954. Ah, okay. Directly from Cambridge. He came to Caltech. Yeah. And he was interested to know if RNA was also double-stranded, like DNA. And he was building models at Caltech to see if he could build a double-stranded molecule. And he wanted me to do a famous experiment that had been done by a wonderful British physical chemist named Gulland, which showed that there are a lot of hydrogen bonds in DNA. I won't go into that. He wanted me to do that same experiment with RNA. So although I was hired as a teaching assistant for the physiology course, which Jim taught, Hmm. at Woods Hole. And Francis was there, Sidney Brenner was there, George Gamow was there. Wow, oh yes. Rosalind Franklin was there. So I did this experiment, and it wasn't like DNA at all. And Jim is planning the course for the next week. And he goes to the window, he points down there, and there's a guy sitting under a tree. He says, you see that guy? He has a very high opinion of himself. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. but let's give him the Hershey Chase experiment to do all by himself in one afternoon, see if he's that okay. good. And it's an important experiment, why? It shows that the phosphorus from DNA largely goes well, well, just Very important experiment. Yeah. So it actually didn't prove it because it was a little bit of a yeah. slop. Yeah. But anyway, Jim is pointing down, he's given this really horribly difficult experiment, this poor guy sitting there. <laughs> I feel sorry for this guy. So I went downstairs and I introduced myself and I told them they're making a plot against you. <laughs> they're going to make you do the Hershey Chase experiment all in one afternoon. Anyway, there was Frank trying to solve a mathematical problem. It was a problem of what's called cross-reactivation. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. And he wanted to explain it to me. I knew nothing about phages. Mm -hmm. If you radiate uh, viruses that grow on bacteria, you kill a lot of them. And now, is this right? And now if you infect them so that more than one, a lot of them go into any one bacterium, they can rescue each other and you get more survivors. That's right, because by crossing them. over you can throw away the bad pieces and yeah. assemble one of good pieces. Yeah. But only with a certain likelihood. Yeah. Frank taught is. me right there yeah. on the grass a little bit. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't solve the integrals. It's all just a bunch of Poisson integrals. Mm -hmm. But I could. Now I'm sure he knows more math than I do. But mm -hmm. then I knew a little bit more. Than he. So I did the integrals for him. And we, we wrote a paper actually together based on that. And then I told him of my interest in this DNA thing. And he told me he was coming to Caltech that very September. 
to be a, a postdoc with Joe Bertani, oh. studying what's called the tryptophan effect on page, mm -hmm. another subject. Anyway, we agreed then and there that we would try this, this thing together with the DNA. So he comes to Caltech, and I must have said, look, okay, let's get started. And Frank says, it would be bad for your character. You got to finish your assigned X-ray. And literally, he uh, would you, you didn't have a PhD yet. No. So Frank would not even allow us to begin to toy around with it until I finished the X-ray crystallography. Is Frank older than you? One year older, but much more disciplined. <laughs> Okay. So after I came from New England and I grew up in Hollywood, California, what uh, do you yes. expect? And he went to Harvard as an undergraduate. I only uh, came later when it couldn't have as big an effect on your character. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, I did my X-ray crystallography finally. I never published it because all I needed that to do was satisfy Frank. Of those... Didn't Linus want to publish it? Yes. He always scolded me, you but only gently. I we... wanted to get busy with the DNA. I, I did it. It was fine. My thesis gives uh, exact structure. Sounds marvelous. like that's what got Pauling off <laughs> and on the wrong track. That's another subject, a very interesting subject, and I could tell you some interesting things about it. But anyway, it's the same mistake Jim and Francis made. Their first structure was a triple helix. Yes. And then Rosalind Franklin came up with Maurice Wilkins and said, you forgot the water, mm -hmm. which makes up 30% of the mass in the bee form. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need three chains to fill up the unit cell. Two is enough. The rest is water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Matt, let's get back to the uh, uh, the main storyline here, 1954. So now tell us what happened. So we started using a what was called a preparative ultracentrifuge in the lab of Renato Dulbecco. And the preparative one is one that you can't see inside the tube during the centrifugation. You have to wait until the centrifugation is done, and you take out the tube, you poke a hole in the bottom of a little plastic tube, and you drip out the contents, each drop into a separate test tube, and then for whatever it is you're interested in, you analyze what's in the test tube. Mm -hmm. Our first idea was that we would do this experiment with bacteriophages. At that time, we didn't know that they fall all apart. Now, we weren't using sucrose by this time. We were using rubidium chloride. Bacteriophages you're talking about are the T phages, is that yes, right? Yes, this was T4. Not, not lambda. Not lambda. Okay, that'll That's come up again. Fact. Okay, yes. So, because T4 phage, the, the, the T4 phages uh, fall apart in high salt. We didn't lambda, know that yet. Yeah, lambda doesn't, so just That's bad right. luck. Okay. We didn't know that yet, though. So, we put the T4 phages in the rubidium solution and centrifuge, hoping to form a band. But we made this artificial gradient by first putting very strong solution in the bottom and then less layering it on top, and very gently holding this tube so as not to stir it up. And, and why did you pick rubidium? We wanted something like sodium chloride, but dense. And so there goes sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. The stockroom didn't have cesium, but it had rubidium chloride, so we used rubidium chloride. And we always found that there were fewer live phages coming out that we put in, so we knew they were getting damaged or degraded. It was just a mess. But at about this time, we learned that a, a uh, member of the chemistry department, Jerry Vinograd, had gotten one of the very first, what's called an analytical ultracentrifuge, where there's fancy optical stuff, so you can see the tube as it's spinning around and see what's happening inside the tubes. So we did that, and the very first run by this time, we were using cesium chloride, I believe. For, for a good reason? Yes. We knew the density of DNA was 1.72. So you just look for a solution that gives you density 1.72 so you could get a band. Without that density, it would go to the bottom. And, and rubidium, rubidium you, know. you couldn't get up to 1.72. Ah. But with cesium, you could. Think of it this way. Here's this tube spinning around like that. But we're just going to look down on top of it for the moment that it passes by us, mm -hmm. right? So down here is what we call the bottom, the outside. Up here is the top, the meniscus. This was a preformed cesium gradient? Yeah, I think it was just a cesium chloride solution. So you can either see with ultraviolet light where the phages, which absorbs ultraviolet light, went up or down. In addition to looking to see where ultraviolet light might be absorbed, which is done by the DNA and the phages, mm 
It's called the Schlieren optical system. And it gives you essentially a graph by a particular optical arrangement of the refractive index along the tube. Now, when you turn on the centrifuge, things get compressed more at the bottom than the top because there's a bunch of liquid forcing the bottom down. So you'd expect that the refractive index would be a little higher near the bottom. That's okay. That happens the moment you reach speed. But then as I'm watching this thing over the next couple of hours, this line, this graph that you see through an eyepiece is going up and up and up. Hmm. And that means that the density difference between the top and the bottom is increasing. A density gradient is forming. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised because I realized that if you waited long enough, the cesium chloride, which is heavier than water, would tend to accumulate towards the bottom. But I thought that being such a small thing, cesium ions and chloride ions, that they would be diffusing very rapidly. It would take a long time to reach equilibrium. Well, it's a long story, but I finally realized that my intuition was dead wrong and that within a few hours you are very close to equilibrium. Well, this was a great boon for us. It was a godsend because now we didn't have to layer solutions and make these artificial gradients. Mm -hmm. It would form automatically. Mm -hmm. And that, then pretty soon, I don't remember if it was the very next experiment, we began to see bands. But still the phages were falling apart. And so we switched to pure DNA. Mm -hmm. At this point, Frank and I got off into some other things. Namely, we thought, oh, here's a new way to measure molecular weights. Because at equilibrium, mm -hmm. only Brownian motion determines the width of the band. And so I, I knew enough thermodynamics to write all the equations how to get molecular weights that way. We did a number of other things, working on the theory of density, and we published that. Mm -hmm. And Vinograd was involved in that. Vinograd was mainly involved in teaching us how to use the thing and in sort of watching over what we were doing theoretically and experimentally. Mm -hmm. So this became my thesis, which is in two parts. The first part is the X-ray crystallography of NN prime dimethyl melanamide, mm -hmm. which was the mm -hmm. thing Pauling assigned me to do. And the other was density gradient centrifugation for studying macromolecules. And at that time, we had done calf thymus DNA. So my thesis has a picture of that. And we published in 1957, which is the year, I think, the year in which I took my thesis exam. It had been discovered in Germany that you can grow bacteria in the presence of 5-bromouracil, which is like thymine, except take away the hydrogen from the 5 position and put a bromine. That makes it heavier. And Rose Littman in Berkeley, a graduate student of Gunther Stint, had discovered that phages grown in that stuff, phage T4, uh, you get a lot of mutations. And this was a complete sidetrack for Frank and me. We spent a lot of time studying the mutagenesis so the idea was, if you want to learn anything about DNA sequencing, and this may sound hopeless today, but you have to get different chemical mutagens and then map the sites where they make mutations. And if you knew the chemistry of the mutation, you could say that site is an AT or a GC or a CG. And laboriously, you could accumulate information about DNA sequencing with specific chemical mutagens. Okay, so you had this idea in your head about using the fact that cesium chloride formed a density gradient after not too many spins, uh, but you got sidetracked in a sense because you and Frank were so fascinated by the problem of mutagenesis. Yes. The 5BU had another aspect, which was a density label. Yes. What are we going to use? Well, heavy hydrogen. We were worried that heavy hydrogen might upset the inner workings of the cell because it is a little different. It's chemically a little different. The bond strengths are different. Mm -hmm. So we were attracted to the idea of making phages dense, dense with 5 bromouracil T4 phages. Anyway, we never made it work. 5BU was hopeless. So that's why we turned to nitrogen 15, because that is heavier, and we could get uniform incorporation. I see. And still we were working with phages, which kept falling apart. Mm -hmm. And then Frank went off to Missouri on a job search, but we were all ready to do it with bacteria. And there are two ways you can do the experiment. Bacterial DNA. Yes, E. coli. You can go from heavy to light or light to heavy. And it should be equivalent in the mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. 
And Frank had to go off for a job interview to Missouri. And he, he's, he knew that I was going to continue our experiment. And I had planned, and he warned me, don't do both experiments at once. Don't do the heavy to light and the light to heavy, because you'll mix them up. <laughs> I think I had a bad reputation. So I did, I said, I, I'm going to use color coding. Mm -hmm. I won't mix them up. I did the experiment and I mixed them up. <laughs> anyway, because it was a mixed up experiment, when Frank came back, we repeated it and called the repeat experiment number one, because the bad experiment was going to be confined to oblivion. Even though in that experiment I saw hybrid DNA and realized it was working, but uh, then it all worked out just from then very simple. Well, explain. What happened exactly? Okay, so we, the, the next experiment we started with heavy, we grew the bacteria for many generations in heavy medium. So everything is uniformly nitrogen. So that would 50. band near the, down toward the bottom, that We DNA. adjusted the density so it banned below the middle. Yeah. And uh, we verified that by looking at the sample that had never been switched to light. And then at various intervals, we take a sample from the growing culture and centrifuge the cells down and resuspend them in light medium and let them grow for n amount of time. And if n was zero, of course, that's no change at all. But if n was a part of a generation, a fraction of it, let's say a quarter of a generation, we see the beginning of the appearance of a hybrid density band, one halfway between high, heavy and light. And to her amazement, when the bacteria had just doubled, when the number of bacteria per milliliter in the culture had doubled, there was only one band. It was the hybrid band. So this is something that I now realize has always puzzled me about this famous result. You must have, by luck, picked um, a generation time, which gave you just one start. Because we now know, if the back, isn't this right, that if the bacteria replicate faster in richer medium, you'll get a start. And then before it's finished, you'll if get we were another in start. Medium, but you can't have nitrogen-15 in rich ah, medium because you I can't see. buy nitrogen-15 cow extract. I see. So, so they were growing slowly enough yes. so that you got only one DNA we replication didn't know that start. We did at the time. Luck all so, over the place. <laughs> incredible luck. So here we see that it, one generation, and that we knew one generation because the bacteria had doubled. Our idea then was there probably a bag full of lots of little molecules mm -hmm. inside the In cell. each cell. Isn't it slightly mysterious? Why wouldn't there be more? Well, John Cairns later found, first of all, that it's a circle, it's and funny. only one circle. Yeah. And later it was found that in this kind of poor medium, there's only one growing point. And so no matter where you are when you add the heavy medium, or, or switch to light, in one generation, everybody has gone around the circle to the place where it was a generation ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all the DNA is replicated once, and only once. Mm -hmm. And so you see this beautiful result of only hybrid DNA at one generation, mm -hmm. all the molecules obeying the same clock mm -hmm. for a reason we did not know at that time. Okay, so, so just fill us in a bit more. We kept going. At two generations, we saw hybrid the... and completely light, yes. as you'd expect. Yes, I see. And in each generation, the amount of hybrid relative to the total went down by half because bacteria duplicate. Mm -hmm. And so was Frank there when you had the, I mean, this must have been a eureka moment when you realized how beautiful this was going to come out. The first time I saw DNA, Frank was away, yeah. and I was alone in the dark room with the wife of Rene Cohen. Uh -huh. And I let out a shriek, and if she were here and alive, she'd remember that, mm -hmm. I think. A, a historian of science, a very good guy from Yale, named Frederick Larry Holmes, who died. I, I, learned more about our, our experiment than we knew. Mm -hmm. He went through our notebooks, and here in this room over whiskey, we would sit and he'd ask us questions and we'd try and remember the answers and he'd look in our notebooks. and It was just amazing. And this happened again and again. He'd come back to us. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the book is very boring because it's so detailed. But, but it's, it's a blow-by-blow blow description yes. of what we did. Can I just say, I, it's, it, I would have thought it would be unreadable. But in fact, it's quite gripping. He's a very good writer, and, and somehow these things really play out in them. So, okay, but then you explained this to Frank, and you must have said, ah, 
Well, I didn't have to explain Every, anything. Uh, but, I, you know, we show them the, the results. Yeah, so then you sure. draw out on paper oh, yeah, what's yeah. going to happen, and yes. boom, you just yes. go look for it. Yes. And then how long till you had the perfect results, which you well, had to put together? another experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I heated this hybrid DNA. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So it won, you grow the bacteria for one generation in the changed medium, and then mm -hmm. all the DNA will be hybrid. Mm -hmm. So you extract that, pure DNA, and you heat it to denature it. Mm -hmm. And I found now two bands. Mm -hmm. And because you can measure the molecular weight also in the gradient by the density, by mm -hmm. the width of the bands, mm -hmm. I could see that the, each of these bands was half the molecular weight of the double helix. Mm -hmm. So clearly what had happened is the heavy and light could be separated, mm -hmm. which means that there was, wasn't any kind of mosaic. As I recall, th there was a long <laughs> discussion which seemed in typical Meselson fashion to be leaning over super backwards to say how the obvious interpretation of your experiment, namely that you had found exactly what Watson and Crick would have predicted, the two strands came apart and so on, uh, could be wrong. That's right. That was, that was in the air at Caltech. Any explanation, perhaps because of Max's influence, but the people around Max were of like mind, Frank was, Maybe it's not the way you say. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a famous story about a fellow named Alex Weinstein is in a train with his little nephew. And the nephew looks out the window and says, look, uncle, all those sheep have just been shorn. And Weinstein looks and he says, on this side at least. <laughs> I love well, there was yeah. this kind of attitude. Yeah, yeah. No matter what you say, maybe mm -hmm. you could think of a mm -hmm. different way. And so we decided to be purists and to, make, to write up the experiment so that Every conclusion from it came out of the experiment itself and not from any other knowledge. So we did, for that reason, say that what, DNA is made of two subunits, not mm -hmm. strands, subunits. Mm -hmm. And maybe the subunits are the single strands of the Watson Creek double helix. But this boils down to saying um, that DNA is either two stranded or four stranded. Or six, or eight. Or six, or, or eight. Yeah. I had a graduate student named uh, John Menninger. Mm -hmm. We did low angle scattering. And with low angle scattering, you can measure the linear density of the DNA. So it was twice. And the other experiment was done by Ron Rolfe while still at Caltech. And for that, he sonicated the DNA to see if the bands would broaden, that would separate heavy from light, and they didn't. So that wiped out that possibility that the subunits were end to end instead of side by side. And then, of course, John Cairns really settled it by showing that lambda DNA is just an ordinary double helix because he measured the linear density mm -hmm. directly by knowing how long it was and how much DNA is in a lambda head. Before moving on, let's just summarize why um, the messelson stahl experiment is so treasured and famous. What do you think? Well, here at Woods Hole in 1954, which was this first summer after the Watson and Crick papers. Jim was here, Francis was here, Cindy Brandon was here, Gamoff was here. I think, the, and I was here, the majority view was it's a model. It may or may not be right. It's the model, because that's what it was. The only evidence that it existed is the fact that it was so beautiful. It explained things in a simple way, unbelievable number of things. It also had a psychological effect, I think, because it was visual. You could see. It meant that it was real. It meant, in a sense, it meant. And I think Jim, in his book, has said that after that experiment, he had no more doubts about the model himself. Quite a few people, I think, who were not in biology at the time, perhaps particularly chemists and physicists, have told me that when they saw the experiment, they decided to enter the field for their own careers. So it maybe had some effect of bringing in some people, good people. It also, of course, answered the question of how, of whether the semi-conservative model was correct. It was. Mm -hmm. So I think it had that role. And did it have any other effects? Well, it had a big effect on us, of course, at that <laughs> young age, mm -hmm. to do an experiment that suddenly you're invited to go all over the world and talk about it. It was pretty exhilarating. Mm -hmm. And allowed me to meet a lot of people who would be a generation or more ahead of me who I would never have had the benefit of knowing. I think you should acknowledge at least the beauty of the, the effect of the beauty of the experiment. It was incredibly beautiful. Yeah, I think it was John Cairns who said, 
He could have said that about other experiments, but he said it's the most beautiful experiment in biology, which became a kind of label or handle for the experiment. But it was beautiful. It wasn't us, it was the nature. <laughs> Yeah, that's what Francis used to say about the DNA molecule. After we did this, we decided to apply it to every conceivable problem. It being it the applicable. cesium chloride gradient. The cesium chloride gradients. So we used it next to see if genetic recombination in phaged lambda is accompanied by breakage of the molecules. The other idea was copy choice, which would not involve such breakage. And that showed there's breakage. Those experiments were partly done as a collaboration with Jean, Jean Weigel. Jean Weigel. Yes. Say a word about him. Well, Jean was a, a member of a very prominent Geneva family, an old family, who uh, his wife died of tuberculosis, so he came, I guess heartbroken, to California. And he appeared in Max's lab one day, and Jean never dressed fancy. He looked like a very distinguished janitor. And asked Max for a, a job. He was a professor of physics, did x-ray diffraction in Geneva, interested in biology. Mm -hmm. And so, so you were able to so combine we, genetics with the, the density yeah, gradient experiment. Yeah, very simple experiments. Yeah. All we did was to make a cross with two factors, clear plaque formation and host range, and with a heavy against the light. And we found that if we drip the tubes, and in case of lambda, it doesn't mind being in cesium chloride. And we found that the recombinants had a density predicted by what would happen if you broke here and joined could be break and copy or break and join. And we made that clear. It could be either one. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in that paper, we proposed that in recombinants, there should be a piece of hybrid DNA at the junction point. So in a sense, it was a whiff of the holiday thing. And that was because partly we already knew from Leventhal that hybrid DNA is, and that came from Hershey originally, is, is formed in the course of phage recombination. Uh, Hershey how well did you know Al? Well, only from the summers at Cold Spring Harbor. I think you probably knew him better. A little bit. He was an amazing character, wasn't he? He was. He was he, my analogy would be to Sanger, that he mm -hmm. was dedicated to doing the most important experiments with the most deft touch, mm -hmm. and a laboratory man from top to bottom. So, so anyway, we applied it to the problem of genetic crossing over. And later I did it heavy against heavy to show that you really do get joining as well as breakage. And then the question was, is ribosomal RNA stable? Because uh, you could do the experiment, basically. So we did that, and it turned out ribosomal. And that was important, because when it became pretty clear that the messenger was unstable, that meant it was very unlikely that it was ribosomal RNA. The stability thing, are you referring to the experiment with Jacob and Brenner? No, I'm referring to the experiment with Rick Davern. Hmm. A simple experiment of just doing a transfer experiment with ribosomal RNA to ask how long does the heavy molecule that was synthesized in heavy medium hang around. And so then, just skipping uh, to the, the heart of this, so then there's this famous meeting in England, right? In Sydney's room? Yes. Well, let me precede that because it's an interesting story. There's a meeting in Brussels where Jacques, and I was there, where Francois tells all this story. There has to be an unstable messenger. Jim is in the front row reading a newspaper. I'm sitting nearby. Uh, everybody was there. Nobody asks a question. In Francois's book, The Statue Within, he says, no one batted an eyelash. No one asked a question. There was no, people just didn't get it. It was after that, in April, Francois is coming to report yet another experiment. Sydney and, and Al Guerin and uh, Francis Crick are in Sydney's rooms in, in Cambridge, Cambridge, England. And there, he, Francois has finally convinced them of what the French were believing for a while, that there's an unstable message. And that's where Sydney, apparently, and Francis both according to the accounts written by Sidney and by Francois, leapt to their feet because they remembered the old experiments done by uh, Astrakhan and Vulcan. They infect cells with phage. An RNA is made, but it has the base composition of the phage, not of the bacteria. So it's being made from the phage. What is it for? Their first two papers suggest maybe it's a precursor. It's being made back into DNA. Mm 
The third paper says maybe it's a template for protein synthesis, huh. but no one ever mentions this. Mm -hmm. But they had the right guess. They had no evidence, but that was the right guess. But that had all been forgotten. And so then that very same day, uh, Sydney saw that the right way to find out is to use density gradient centrifugation to see if the RNA made by phage infection is found on ribosomes that were made before you even added the phage. And that worked. And by the way, he had already planned to come to Caltech to do that experiment with me, but to do it completely different. We were intensely interested which mutations correspond to what kind of changes in the DNA. So the idea was we we're going to make mutations with 5-bromouracil and 2-aminopurine and other mutagenic chemicals and map each mutation so finely that we begin to say, that's AT, this is GC, and so on. But fortunately, because that would have been a total waste of time, fortunately, Sidney got the idea of doing the other experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, I recently glanced at that famous paper, and uh, <laughs> you could, it, it reads almost like uh, the effect of magnesium on things. I was trying to ban ribosomes in cesium chloride, and I wrote him a letter before they came, saying that I would increased the magnesium and all I was doing was watching the, the particles fall apart. So I was increasing the magnesium, but I didn't increase it enough. So just tell us a little about, about the messenger okay. experiment. Okay, well, Sidney and Francois came. Francois has a lot of shrapnel in his legs from the war, where he ran out into the field when German fighters were coming down in machine gunning to rescue a pal. He was a combat medic, and this caused him great pain. So he didn't do the experiment. He sat in a chair I thought and recorded arm... the results. Sydney's contribution was to drip out the drips. My contribution was to run the centrifuge. And we used a heavy isotope medium, of course, which was only available because this required the carbon as well as nitrogen to give an extra degree of resolution. There was no else, nowhere else in the world that it could have been done. So how did you detect the new messenger on the old ribosome. You have phages, and you're yeah. going to inf affect them. You're going to affect bacteria with those phages. Yeah. In the presence of P32. Ah, P32. Or yeah. treated uracil. So the RNA will be radioactive. And the uh, ribosomes, you can recognize by their ultraviolet mm -hmm. absorption. <laughs> Phage infection blocks the production of new ribosomes. Al Hershey had already discovered something that made that pretty likely. Mm -hmm. But this showed there just weren't any new ribosomes. So any ribosomes that are there have to be old, and yet the new RNA is found mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. And so that... That did it. So w isn't there some famous story of Sydney on the beach realizing so you should double the magnesium? There was a Gordon conference in New Hampshire on nucleic acids and proteins. In those days, they were held together, the two co topics. And so the very last day that they could have done any experiments, that's the day I'm leaving. And that day, nothing had worked. The ribosomes fell apart. We already knew that when Sydney came and tried to stabilize them with formaldehyde and then glyceraldehyde. None of that worked. They kept falling apart. Up until the day that I left, and Hildegard Lamfram took them to Malibu, or maybe Santa Monica, some beach. And she was working on hemoglobin synthesis in vitro. And what Francois told me was that she had to add a lot of magnesium to make the in vitro synthesis of hemoglobin from reticulocytes work. And at that point, apparently, Sidney jumped up, according to Francois, and yelled and said, it's the magnesium. So they went right back. They left their picnic lunch, went right back to Caltech, set up an experiment, put it in the centrifuge, and went to bed. And the next morning, they dripped out the tubes, and it worked. <laughs> and that was the experiment that worked. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, they gave a talk at Caltech I got a, f a phone call, maybe I placed a call, maybe Sydney did, while I was at the Gordon Conference. That's how I learned about the result. So I missed the excitement of the, of, the, of the result. I was there right up until practically the moment that they added the extra magnesium. So now to summarize, there's the, 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 the cesium thing has led to, which you discovered by accident, <laughs> which <laughs> has led to this wonderful confirmation of Watson and Crick. It's led to a striking demonstration of break and join. It's now essentially proved the instable intermediate exists in his messenger RNA, which is, of course, the basis of the whole thing. Uh, was that it for cesium chloride? No, one more thing. And that is that 
we wondered whether the DNA in bacteria was homogeneous or whether it was patches of different stuff. Uh -huh. And by that time, we knew that our DNA was all broken up. Uh -huh. So Ron Rolfe, a graduate student, a very brilliant guy, died very young as a brain tumor. Uh -huh. But anyway, we did cesium chloride. There were huge variations in the GC content, all the way from maybe 20% AT to 80% AT, depending on the species of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And what we found was each one gives a very narrow band, showing that the DNA is not heterogeneous, at least down to the level of the pieces that we mm -hmm. were centrifuging. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ribosomal RNA doesn't change very much, which was another yeah. yeah, which was another argument why the ribosomal RNA was probably not the message, because if it mm -hmm. was, it should be coming from all over the DNA mm -hmm. and be fairly representative. We didn't make that connection at the time. We were only asking about the heterogeneity of bacterial uh, DNA as its own question. Mm -hmm. So all of these uh, signal experiments were actually done at Caltech, correct? Yes. So since you went from Caltech to Harvard, and since Jim Watson was establishing this department at Harvard and wanted you there, and say a word or two about the nature of the atmosphere at Caltech. There are at least three components. The first was a very close connection between graduate students, postdocs, and faculty. They're really, the doors were all open. Max must have insisted on it, so that was wonderful. The next thing was that no matter what you said, somebody would try and figure out why it could be wrong. <laughs> and we enjoyed this. Uh -huh. It wasn't an insult. And you could come back at them why that might be wrong. Uh -huh. So it's a very nice thing. It, you could think about it at night. You could think about it in bed. You could, it kept you thinking. Mm -hmm. And the third thing was uh, informality of life there. Not just that the faculty were available, but they come to your parties. Dick Feynman came to almost all of our parties, played his drums, and he was very interested in biology. During the messenger RNA experiment, Dick was there almost every evening, and we almost always, the three of the four of us went out to dinner together. Really? Steak dinners. And then after uh, Francois and Sidney left, Dick and I did experiments. We wanted to isolate enough messenger RNA to begin to characterize it as a molecule. And Dick worked in the cold room grinding. He used really? To grind. Yes. And we did sucrose gradients to localize the messenger RNA. And Dick asked a question I never would have asked. He said, how do you know that everything you put in comes out the other end? Well, conservation of mass is sort of important in <laughs> physics. Yeah. But it would never occur to me that if you layer a certain amount of stuff on the sucrose gradient, uh -huh. that it all comes out the tube. Well, it didn't. 90% was missing because we rinsed the tube with hydrochloric acid and now the rest of the radioactivity came out. So what's going on? It's obviously sticking to the walls. So we'll make tubes. Caltech had a marvelous shop out of Teflon. Nothing sticks to Teflon. It sticks just the same. <laughs> and with Teflon, it's so hard and expensive. Mm -hmm. You can't poke a hole each time. Mm -hmm. You have to reuse those tubes. So we had to build a machine with a plunger from the top so we could collect the stuff through a little tube from the plunger. And then I got the idea, add a little of something else so it cover the walls. And so we added gelatin, and now it works perfectly. Everything you put in comes out. But there he was with conservation of mass, and a characteristic of Feynman it was he wouldn't ever go on to the next experiment until he understood the one you'd just done, even if it was a failure. He hmm. wouldn't go on to the next one. It was a great pleasure working with him. By the way, he's the one who discovered uh, intergenic suppression. After I left, he worked with Bob Edgar, and he made the reasonable speculation that if you make a mutation in a phage gene, it has a phenotype, maybe you could make another mutation in the very same gene that would correct the effect of the first mutation, suppress it. Mm -hmm. And he did that, and he published it. I never saw the publication, but I was told that it was published in the Caltech student newspaper and nowhere else. <laughs> Could that have had any effect on Crick and Brenner and the no, famous? No, I, I doubt they even knew it. After Mendel, in my opinion, the most beautiful experiment is the one that showed the structure of the genetic code. Not the code words, not cracking the code, the structure. Showing that it was a it. triplet. Yeah, and it was there. a surprise. There were many ingenious ideas about codes, but one that nobody thought of in advance was the correct one. It came out only from experiment. The reason you think this experiment is so beautiful I guess, is because this isn't done by DNA sequencing. No. This is all by abstracting. Pure genetics. It answers the deepest question of all. Not what is the code. 
What's the structure of the code? Mm -hmm. That's a deep question. Mm -hmm. So what kind of atmosphere was there in those early days at Harvard? When I got there, there was no separate department of molecular biology. There was the biology department and the chemistry department and a little committee of higher degrees in biochemistry. So the atmosphere at Caltech was already where, in a friendly way, you shoot down every idea that anybody else has, if you can, and suggest another idea, which really sharpens up your ideas. And that carried over to Harvard, mm -hmm. to that group of us in molecular biology, once it became a department. And even at department meetings, uh, there was vigorous debate, very often. And there were 17 members, I think. Uh, nearly everybody was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we had four or five Nobel Prize winners. So you know, anyway, it was a great department. Yeah, so I remember it. So can we switch gears? Yeah, what did I do at Harvard? I was interested in gene conversion. Mm -hmm. Gene conversion is when you have in a diploid the gen gene the base sequence on one is removed and replaced with the base sequence on the other one so that now they're identical on both. People interpreted that to mean that somehow the DNA of one DNA molecule was removed over a certain region and copied back from the other DNA molecule so they both now were identical over a short track. It's like a double crossover, except now we like to get down to the mechanism. And so it became possible because of Dale Kaiser to know how to separate the two strands of lambda DNA and get them pure and separate. So we could take the Washington strand from a different genotype than the Crick strand. So now we have DNA which is mismatched. Let's say at only one site, because the two different DNAs we're going to use differ by only one mutation. So now we have a double helix which is at odds with itself, so to speak. One strand says this, and the other strand says that. And so now the question is, what comes out of this? So Judy Weilenberg, who was a wonderful geneticist. She was a student or a postdoc? She was a postdoc. And made these mixed, these hybrid molecules with like a particular mutation like clear 87 and wild type. And you could transfect the bacterial cell with just naked DNA. And now you plate these cells before the phages come out. It's called infective centers mm -hmm. on a Petri dish with uh, auger and bacteria. And then you pick each of these infective centers after it's burst and multiplied a little bit and played all the phages from that and look to see what you've got. And in some cases, you'll find that although you had one of each kind to begin with, only one kind comes out. And you'll find that depending on which mutations you do this with, there are biases. Sometimes this one likes to prevail, sometimes this one likes to prevail, and they're characteristic of the mutation. So it showed that. If you do it with two different ones, they get modified together, showing that this changes over a tract, over a length. So we were able, therefore, to measure tract lengths to show that the basis of this kind of conversion is mismatch correction, which would essentially scratch away one or the other and recopy from the one that wasn't scratched away, so that now both strands would be the same at that position. And that's a form of gene conversion. So she showed that. And that was important because it was required by certain models of recombination. Then the next thing that happened was we did it with multiple mutations. And Bob Wagner, a graduate student, showed that you could measure the length of tracts over distances like a kilobase or so. Then at the end of that work, I asked myself, it was a kind of very naive question, but what good is this? Does nature make any use of it? So remember, DNA replicates semi-conservatively. So we have an old strand and a recently built strand. So if the gene conversion, the scratching away, could be confined to the new strand, if you'd made a mistake in copying the old strand, the mismatch tells you, here's where the mistake is, and this is the strand on which it is located. Matt, it might be worth emphasizing that the way mutations generally arise is not by affecting the pre-existing strand, but by mistakes in making oh, the yes. new strand. Just, just this is absolutely worth important saying. to say. That these are replication errors. So if you have made a replication error, by definition, it's on the new strand that you've just tried to make accurately and you failed to do so. Mm -hmm. 
So if only the mismatch correction could always be directed at the new strand, it would be a way of correcting your replication errors. Maybe not perfect, but an awful lot better than just letting them go by. So how would you recognize the newly synthesized strand? Well, it was already known that DNA is methylated in many species, not all. And that the methylation is laid down as a separate step after the DNA is made, a few minutes later. So that means that so long as you get in there before the methylation happens, the new strand has no methyl groups, and the old one does have them. So if you could have a system that would say, aha, there's a mismatch, and aha, this is the strand which has no methyl groups, I'll scratch that stuff away and let it be resynthesized, maybe the second time it will resynthesize it correctly, that would be mismatch correction. So I predicted that in the paper with Wagner. So now we need an enzyme that can go looking for a mismatch. OK, there's a mismatch. And then the enzyme has to say, which of you two strands has no methyl groups? The old strand remains methylated. Yes, when the it's copied, don't come off. They don't come off, right. They don't okay. come off. So the enzyme now finds a mismatch, and then it says, which of you two strands is not methylated? Oh, it's you. I will remove this piece of DNA. Try again. Copy again. Maybe you'll get it right the next time. So it's a terrific way. It increases the fidelity of DNA copying by a couple orders of magnitude. It's a big effect. So, so if you knock out this system, you get a lot more mutations. So in organisms that don't have DNA methylation, flies, yeast? There has to be another way to recognize the new <laughs> strand. And so this idea might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. But we put it forward anyway, mm -hmm. because maybe there's other ways. In fact, I think we even said maybe the proximity to a break. So that turns out to be important. And there are people who don't have a gene to do this correctly. And they have a certain familial um, intestinal cancer. OK, so now this in, um, invocation of DNA methylation to explain this very important thing led to another extremely important experiment that you and Bob Ewan did. Yes. Can you please give us a little of the background? OK, the connection there isn't direct. It's just the similar things floating around in your brain well, about DNA and methylation. That's how everything so, works, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so there is a phenomenon discovered by Jean Weigel and Salvador Luria called host modification and restriction. It means this, or one manifestation is this. If you grow a phage in bacteria A, it can reinfect bacteria A, usually, but it can't infect bacteria B, if B is a certain kind of a bacterium. What happens? It injects its DNA, but the DNA is demolished, down to completely broken down. And Lederberg, that is Seymour Lederberg, the brother of Joshua, came to Harvard. And we did an experiment that shows that it's completely broken down in such cases. Oh, yes, so in other words, the bacteria you came from, if you're a phage, leaves a mark that tells you what other bacteria you can and cannot survive in. So the question is, what is this mark? And what is the means by which you are destroyed if you don't have the right mark? Well, there had already been evidence that methylation might be involved. We were interested to isolate the enzyme that does the murder. So it's easy to do. You make lambda phage DNA with radioactive tritium. You make another bunch of lambda DNA labeled with a different isotope that you can tell the difference in a Geiger counter, label it with P32. And one lambda is grown in a strain that produces lambda that cannot grow in the other strain. It's demolished if it tries. So we made these two kinds of DNA. And the first thing, you sediment them in a sucrose gradient to make sure that your DNA is OK. So you drip out the stuff, and you see that the P32 band and the tritium band are both nice big bands in the right place. So that, that just shows your reagents are OK. Then you incubate this mixture of two kinds of DNA with the bacteria that doesn't do rejection. So they both should survive. And they do. So that shows there isn't some other goop that might preferentially kill off your DNA, or, some, or even non-preferentially. And then the critical experiment is that you uh, make the DNA, the extract from cells that do kill the, un, uh, the uh, unmodified DNA and see what happens. OK, well, nothing happened. That's three tubes in a centrifuge rotor. 
there are six tubes in a centrifuge rotor of the kind we were using. What to do with the other three? Can't just waste them and fill them with water. So I thought, what do biochemists do? They add cofactors. So I added, I don't know what, but including one of them was ATP. Gee, I'm really pretty ignorant about biochemistry. I think I inherit this as a form of restriction modification from <laughs> Max Delbrick, yeah. who hated biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the AT, well, ATP one, all the DNA that came from the non-modifying bacteria was demolished. So I had discovered this activity. So just to make this clear, you had discovered that there's an activity, which is a code word for an enzyme, uh -huh. in this strain <laughs> that preferentially, to a huge uh, degree actually, destroyed the DNA from the foreign strain, but not its own DNA. That's right. And it needs ATP. So I started to purify this enzyme by the usual methods of column fractionation. The activity goes away. At this point, Bob Ewan came to the lab. Anyway, we knew from an unpublished experiment of Bill Wood, if cells are deprived of methionine, they can't do the restriction. <laughs> Therefore, it sounded like something involving methionine was needed. I think what we did was to just add plain old methionine. And it brought the experiment there, now it works again. Mm -hmm. And I kept on purifying, and the activity went away again. Well, you had to add it, plus ATP, in order to get the restriction activity. Did I get that right? We needed to add what was necessary. Uh, there's a paradox here. Not only does this enzyme chop, mm -hmm. it also methylates. It's a dual purpose Yes, but enzyme. what you were measuring at that point was the chopping. At that point, we were doing the chopping, and which requires acidenosyl methionine. Okay. At this point, Bob Ewan, who was working in the library, because I told him after he came to the lab, spend some time just reading about restriction and modification in the library, he comes up and has the answer, because he knew biochemistry. And he said, well, if it needs methionine and ATP, acidenosyl methionine is made by mixing methionine with ATP with a certain enzyme. So now we added acidenosyl methionine, and it turned out that now we thought we could dispense with the ATP. It's all only there to make more not true. So there was one more step where this, we were surprised, that you have to keep the ATP present as well as the acidenosyl methionine. The enzyme needs them both to work. Does it use up the ATP as it works? Yes. As it, and we know now that that's because it drives the enzyme along the molecule looking for mismatches like a bloodhound, so mm -hmm. to speak. <laughs> so we wrote up the manuscript and gave it to Sal Valuria to submit to the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He took weeks and returned it to me, saying that I should shorten it. Well, at this point, a sub-editor of Nature came through the lab and said, why don't you send it to Nature? We'll take it. So we remodified the format and got it published in Nature. But before it came out in Nature, a different paper from uh, Werner Arber and Stuart Lynn was published in which they were using a related but different restriction system and they knew about the need for ATP and acidenosyl methionine. And in their paper, they have a footnote which says that our results confirm the finding of Messelson and Yuan that these cofactors are required. But they don't say how they knew that. The reason they knew that is that in those days, we talked about everything. We never kept any secrets. I believe I sent a preprint of the long paper to Werner. And in any case, Bob Ewan, at some place meeting, met up with uh, Stu Lin and told him what we had discovered. So what Werner should have written was, we learned about the cofactor requirements. That would be perfectly reasonable. And we did that, and it worked. And then it's OK if he publishes first. Would you? recommend that people keep secrets? and No. It's more fun the other way. Of course. In the long run, it's still better. Mm -hmm. um, it does mean that you should write up your papers pretty quick and get them published, <laughs> if you care about this sort yeah. of thing. And I'm, uh, Frank and I are both notorious. Uh, we took ages to write up the semi-conservative replication of DNA. And finally, as is written in many books, Max Delbrook took us down to the Caltech Marine Station at Corona del Mar, locked us in a room with a typewriter. Manny Delbrook would open the room occasionally and put in a lunch or a meal, 
and wouldn't let us out till we produced some kind of a manuscript. Well, can I point out, you still haven't written up your PhD thesis. This is a scandal <laughs> that we've revealed today. <clears throat> well, this is really an important issue because, I mean, I, I don't see how it's possible to do science keeping secrets. I mean, who would want to do it that way? But people have bad experiences. Okay, so Ham Smith got the Nobel Prize for restriction enzymes. Yes, type two restriction yeah, enzymes. Yeah, uh, well, I noticed in the thing they, that was written, and in fact, I wrote the Nobel Committee, uh, they said that these people had discovered the first restriction enzymes. And I pointed out that this is false. I didn't actually know about our bear, but I said, oh, Matt did this first. And of course, they didn't answer me. But um, maybe you should explain the just completely serendipitous fact that their enzymes turned out to be more useful. Oh. So this type 1, as they're called, because they were discovered first, the kind that I and Bob Ewan purified, and they wander around and find a place to chop. So they're no good for getting a discrete end. Many different kinds of ends are produced, because it doesn't chop in exactly the same place mm -hmm. every time. So the reason type 2 turned out to be so useful was because of recombinant DNA and sticking yes. DNA molecules together. Oh, absolutely. And if you didn't have a known place of cutting, but that was just purely Right, and our restriction ends are useless for this. Ham Smith has written that when he got the message from the Nobel Prize, and this is complete Ham Smith, who's just a 2,000% modest and Yes, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Said that he clapped his head or something like that and said it should have been Messelson, which is not true because our enzyme had nothing to do with genetic engineering. So Matt, in these descriptions of your work on recombination, uh, you didn't mention something that people were heavily influenced by called the messelson radding model. I won't ask you to explain it in detail, but what, why was that so important to so many people? Well, there was a previous model, the holiday model, for how genetic crossing over happens at the DNA level where you cut, what you join, what you chew back, how you resolve it, all those details. So Holiday came up with a very promising model, but wasn't able to explain certain asymmetries in the results of crosses in fungi. So Radding and I proposed a model that was able to handle the basic asymmetry of the process of genetic recombination. It started with cutting both chains of one molecule, and the model was wrong. The right model is you make a gap, which sounds murderous, but that's the way the real thing works. But there was about 10 years between the so-called messelson ratting model and the later model from Chastock and Rodney and Frank Stahl and, or Weaver. So I gather that this stimulated a lot of research. So although it was wrong, I'm told, because I didn't do the subsequent research, but some people might say that it stimulated a great deal of research which eventually got a much superior model. Mm -hmm. The same has happened in physics. The Bohr model was wrong, but a lot of work on the Bohr model, and you come up with quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Just occurs to me while we're sitting here, a couple of years ago, I had dinner in Paris with Miro Radman. Miro worked in my lab furiously hard trying to isolate an enzyme involved in genetic recombination, and we couldn't find anything. And he was willing to do enormous amount of work, but it just wasn't going to happen. But then after I predicted that there should be methyl-directed mismatch repair, on a visit back, and also, also together with uh, Barry Glickman, Mero did an experiment and we wrote a paper. It wasn't proof, but it was pretty strong evidence that mismatch correction really occurs, directed by methylation. Mero continued doing that kind of experiment, and so did I, and worked out a lot of the fine details. Like the question, if the DNA is fully meth methylated, will the mismatch correction enzyme recognize it at all? And Pat Pukilla in my lab showed it doesn't. You mean if both strands are methylated? Both strands are fully methylated. Which is an important part of the idea. Yeah, it's it totally is. protected. The mm -hmm. enzyme doesn't bother it. Mm -hmm. And we showed that we isolated the methylation activity by itself. And we showed that there's binding between these certain sites. We characterized the sites and the enzyme. We did a lot of other stuff on the mismatch correction. Mm -hmm. Haberman, Ellen Haberman, and Janet Haywood, and Herschel Raskus. And mm -hmm. This yes. was around the time, I guess, maybe roughly when there were, <laughs> Susan Lindquist was in the lab. I guess it was a little bit later. And uh, 
Steve Heinemann was in the lab a little earlier, and Steve Hennikoff. It was a great bunch mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. But I was away a lot, beginning to be away a lot. Ah, which yeah. leads us conveniently <laughs> to our next subject. I was beginning to spend a lot of time in Washington, really lots of time. In the summer of 1963, my friend Paul Doty in the chemistry department who was on the advisory committee to the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. This is something President Kennedy had created. Does it still exist? It does not still exist. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they were looking to find six academics who would come just for the summer and work on special projects. And I thought it would be interesting, totally different from anything I'd ever known. So I went down there, and my boss, a man named Franklin Long, a wonderful chemist from Montana, that I should work on tactical nuclear weapons arms control in Europe. And they sent very high-level people to brief me. Llewellyn Thompson, who was our ambassador to Moscow at the time. Did you have clearance by then? Yes, you had. everybody in this outfit had very high clearances because the Congress had worried that since uh, these guys are interested in disarmament and arms control, we had to have very good clearances to make sure that none of them were spies. But it meant that you could talk to your office mate because you know that he and you have the same clearances, mm -hmm. even if he's working on something quite different. Mm -hmm. The other criteria for communication was need to know. So I, after about a week or two, I went to Frank Long and said, I don't know anything about tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. I'm a chemist and a biologist. Why not have me look into biological and chemical weapons? He said, fine. And I decided I would look into biological weapons. So I went to the CIA, and then I went to Fort Detrick, and I was taken around by a man named Colonel Leroy Fothergill, a good biologist. And he showed me a seven-story building which had what looked from a distance like windows, but they were fake windows. And he explained that inside really is a big fermenter. We make anthrax. So it's something like, I don't know, maybe 10,000 liter fermenter, big one. And so I asked him, as I recall, well, why do we need it for? And he said, because it's cheaper than nuclear weapons. <laughs> for me, this was the light bulb that went on. <laughs> why would the United States of America, which can afford nuclear weapons when nearly any, no one else can, want to propagate a weapon that everybody could have and that could wipe out great numbers of people? Where were they storing all the anthrax they made? I think they just autoclaved it. They made it to learn how to do the batches. They did collect some. But mainly, we didn't uh, have big stockpiles. Uh, anyway, it seemed to me lunacy that we would promote. And that if we're going to do it, that means we have to legitimize it, because we, we're not going to do something that we're going to condemn. Sorry, this was secret at the time, is that right? Very secret. So I went back to my office, and my office mate was Freeman Dyson, the physicist. I was really new to this game, but he had been government advising for several years. So I must have said to him something like, why would we do that? And he said, Matt, your intuition is wiser than you know, <laughs> which sort of kept me going to some extent. And I decided that I was going to make it my mission to get rid of this stuff. So for the next year, I didn't write about it because I thought to even talk about it was to get others interested. But then other people began to write about it. You know, a former commander at Fort Detrick, General Rothschild, wrote a whole book called Tomorrow's Weapons. And the first thing I ever published was a review of that book. Mm -hmm. So I made a plan. I figured out I have to convince the administration. I have to convince the Congress. I have to get a lot of public support and the scientific, the senior scientific community. How am I going to do that? Can you just pause for one moment? How, can you explain how, unlike almost anyone else, with your fantastic scientific things that were going on, you're willing to drop that in a sense, not really drop it, but spend so much time just doing something else? I don't have an answer, mm -hmm. except it's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It seemed important. Mm -hmm. And it was new, too. It was like a new kind of experiment. No, I thought it would be an intellectual challenge. Scientists sometimes are arrogant and feel they can do stuff that other people can't do. If you make a plan, and I made a plan, so I went to see Howard Simons at the Washington Post. He said, I'm going to write down the name of every science journalist I know of in this country at any newspaper of consequence. Their editors always need something once a week. And biological weapons is a hot topic. They'll write about it. You go talk to them and tell them your views. I did. So that was the press. 
But what could you say to the reporters? You couldn't tell them that we were making anthrax. Oh, no, it was well known that we had a biological weapons program by then. General Rothschild had written his book. The Quakers were picketing at Camp Dietrich. I see. It, no, and, and the government was saying, what well, a nice weapon this was because it doesn't destroy property, and you could have weapons that were not exactly lethal, only kind of make people sick, as well as lethal ones. Oh, no, there were lots of people defending it. Mm -hmm. So Linus had created a petition to thousands of scientists worldwide to stop testing in the atmosphere. I took that as my model. And together testing with, nuclear weapons. Yes, that was nuclear weapons. We got, I think it was 23 mostly Nobel Prize winners, to sign a letter asking other scientists to sign a petition. We got 5,000 some odd signatures. And we printed these all up in a bound book, which said to President Johnson, saying, please review US policy for chemical and biological weapons. Specifically, please review as to whether we should become parties to the Geneva Protocol of 1925, which is a no first use treaty, basically. We won't use chemical or biological weapons unless you use them on us. We had never ratified it. By then I had written papers and published mm -hmm. things and so on. So, uh, and the last thing we asked was, please stop the use of riot control agents and chemical herbicides in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Because although these are mild things compared to nerve gas and anthrax, it's a continuum of agents and once you blur the line, and then we contacted the White House. I think Paul Doty did that. And the science advisor at the time was Don Hornig. Oh, yeah. And Don was all in favor of our petition. He agreed with us completely. And President Johnson gave it to his national security advisors, and it went all through the government. And they ended up by saying, better we should say nothing. Right. They didn't respond. Nevertheless, what it did do was to mobilize the senior scientific community. They would resonate to this issue. The next issue problem was the Congress. So the Congress, I started with staff. And they were interested. It's an interesting subject. And there were particular congressmen who really wanted to use it. One of them was a guy named Max McCarthy from Buffalo, New York, in the House. Mm -hmm. And Senator Fulbright was mm -hmm. another one. And then what about the administration? Well, fortunately, if you were from Harvard in those days, there was Mac Bundy, the dean who hired me. I went to see him right away. He said, Matt, we're too busy to do anything about this, but I'll keep it out of the war plans. Mac was now President Kennedy's national security advisor, just like Kissinger was later. Anyway, uh, Elliot Richardson, I knew him. He was in the Defense Department. Everybody, I was Cyrus Vance, Harriman, because somehow the cachet of coming from Harvard, I think, uh, or he was this interesting kid. I don't know what it was, but no one ever closed the door. Huh. And I wrote memos and so on. And now President Nixon gets elected. And Henry Kissinger was designated by Nixon as his national security advisor. And I remember one day when he asked me, well, what should we do, be doing about your thing? Which, so I told him I'd write him some papers. And uh, it came to the point where nearly everybody agreed that these things were a menace to us if they proliferate. So your argument was, was not, the winning argument was not so much that they were immoral, or no, something. I never argued that. Yeah, But, but the other thing argument... I did emphasize was that there's no use for these weapons. No. You can't think of an engagement that makes any real military sense. And in that, I had a lot of help because the Defense Department couldn't find a use for them. Chemical weapons, that's different. They had a use for them, but not biological weapons. So the Joint Chiefs wanted to keep them. They wanted to keep all options. So, so weren't there drug companies and chemical companies involved? Chemical in companies were very opposed to chemical weapons in modern times. At the time of World War I, they saw it as a way of getting government money to catch up with Germany. But after World War II, Rachel Carson and other people gave chemicals a bad name. And the big chemical industries didn't want anything to do with it. So the whole thing was reviewed by President Nixon. And Henry Kissinger had a particularly important style. He wanted to submit to the president every possible option. So that happened. It was a very good So, so various arms of the Defense Department and the Pentagon and so on were writing these? Yes, each one wrote its own input. So President Nixon in November of 1969 announced that the United States would renounce biological weapons. What is the status now of the various treaties? And there are two big treaties. Yeah. One is the Biological Weapons Treaty, which prohibits the development, production, and transfer of biological weapons. And there's no inspection. 
there's a possibility to appeal to the Security Council. So who has signed that one? Nearly everybody. And then there's the Chemical Weapons Convention, which has elaborate verification and inspection. That was used in Syria recently. Uh -huh. It supervises the destruction of stockpiles all over the world. It's a terrific treaty. And we've signed that. We, we've rather, you, you can sign a treaty and then you have to ratify, ratify. it. Signing so, just, yeah. they're separate. Yeah. And Israel has not ratified it, but they have signed it. But we have ratified it. We have ratified it. it. We're yes. strong proponents of it. I see. And with the help of the chemical industry, which is all for it, they don't want chemicals to have a bad name. I see. <laughs> so we have really made a lot uh -huh. of progress. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Both of these things are outlawed. Uh -huh. And I hope that what this means is that the really advanced knowledge that's coming from our science is not going to be used or is less likely to be used for hostile mm -hmm. purposes. Okay, so now I am familiar with, at least superficially, with three major accomplishments in this area of yours. Uh, <clears throat> the first has to do with defoliation in Vietnam. The second has to do with the so-called yellow rain. And the third has to do with anthrax yes. poisoning in the Soviet Union. Okay. The AAAS, the American Association This is now we're talking about number science. one. The herbicide thing. Yes, asked me to design a study of the effects of herbicides on ecology and health in Vietnam where herbicides were being sprayed. I, I accepted this. They gave me $50,000 to do it on condition that I could do a pilot study because how could you do design a study without having some experience? Then that would require that I go to Vietnam. So I spent six weeks in Vietnam during the war in 1970. So, and, uh, where we, did you stay? What did you do? We were able to fly into villages to collect human milk samples because we had developed, together with Bob Bachman, who was a graduate student, a method for detecting dioxin, a uh, hundred or thousand times more sensitive than existed before that. Well, Actually, you just have to explain. Dioxin is a contaminant of... Of 245T, one of the herbicides. Or, the, or Agent Orange. So-called Agent Orange. Yeah. 245T and 24D mixed together makes Agent Orange. We collected many samples of human milk. We found lots of dioxin in the milk from women who lived along the rivers that drained the sprayed forests, but not women who didn't. Maybe it's worth just reminding people why they were, what they thought they were doing when they were spraying. Okay. The spraying of the forest was to improve visibility. Improve embedded. visibility from so the air. So you could see the ground. Yeah, from the air. Because so, yeah. finding the enemy was a big problem. Because mm -hmm. we had such po firepower that if you found anybody, you could mm. attack them. Why were you worried about dioxin? So I had this report on the toxicity, herb, mutagenicity, teratogenicity, and uh, carcinogenicity of a large number of agricultural chemicals, <laughs> including herbicides. And the only really striking result was that 245T mm -hmm. caused cleft palate, and I think it was in guinea pigs. And there was a Vietnamese student at Harvard who came to me with a stack of newspapers that said there were deformed babies. These were Saigon papers in mm -hmm. Vietnamese. I couldn't read them, blaming it on the herbicides. Mm -hmm. But the two things together I knew would create some publicity. So I called Lee Dubridge, who had been the president at Caltech, so I knew him well. And by now he's Nixon's science advisor. And I go right down there and I tell him this. Anyway, to my astonishment, Lee DeBridge picks up the phone and he calls David Packard, number two at defense. And right there and then they cancel Agent Orange. I would have thought they'd have to review it or ask the president. Really? Period. But they had two other herbicides, white and blue. So we went to Quangnai because there had been a crop destruction mission up there. And we wanted to see it from the helicopter, from the air. And the long range patrol had been out during the night. And they'd seen buckets hanging from the trees. And as far as he could tell from the looks of it and the smell of it, it was human urine and mud. And here's the story. The whole problem in Vietnam, or one of the main problems, at least the way we fought the first part of the war, was to find the main forces and attack them. But how could you find them under all those trees? So we needed some way to find them. If human beings urinate on the ground, urea is converted by bacteria to ammonia gas. The ammonia molecule is a nitrogen with three hydrogens and creates a huge infrared absorption band. Very intense. You can detect the smallest amount. So a, a small infrared spectrometer is designed for helicopters. It's called the people sniffer. And you fly around with this thing, 
until you find a lot of ammonia, and then you call in the gunships and you blast the daylights out of that area. Well, the Vietnamese had figured this out. <laughs> they hung the buckets in the trees. When the uh. people's differ comes, they blew it out of the sky. Uh. <laughs> and it's very interesting and important because it shows that if you're remote from a war scene, the same human brain, some bright guy maybe in Burbank, thought this is going to win the war uh. with his high tech. Uh -huh. But the same human brain is there on the ground in the Vietnamese skulls. And they see how to just turn this thing around 180 degrees and make it work. And it's, it's, an, it's, it's a story about that kind of war in general. Uh -huh. The people who design it in the air-conditioned offices in Washington don't have a clue about what's really happening on the ground, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. That's an exaggeration, but not so yeah. much. Well, now, the end of this story. Mm -hmm. The last day I was there, General Abrams wants to see me. I spent all morning with him. One of the first questions he says, what, have, what did you think about the herbicides? And I thought he meant health effects and ecological effects. He said, no, I mean military utility. And I said, well, we hadn't studied that. And he said, you want to know what I think? I said, yes, sir. He said, and this were his exact words. He said, I think they're shit. <laughs> Do you realize it takes more than a week? It's a three or four weeks before the leaves fall off. Do you think those guys are going to hang around so we can shoot them? <laughs> they know when it's been sprayed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so obvious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there are other reasons why. We flew over an area where there had been crop destruction, and we invited with us the chemical corps colonel who had designed that mission. He told us all the reasons why this had to be enemy soldiers growing food for their own consumption, that there were no houses down there, so no civilians, that there was terracing on the hills, and only Chinese knew how to do terracing, the native pop and Vietnamese, but not the native mountain yard people, that uh, the amount of rice under cultivation had expanded greatly in recent years. When we got back, we had very fine cameras. We developed the pictures. This is all wrong. There are little houses all over the place. The f we got a hold of French photography that was taken in 46, and the very same rice fields were there. There had been no expansion of production. There was terracing, but we found an anthropology book that this particular tribe, called the Hooray tribe, were unusual. Unlike other mountain yards, they practiced terracing. Everything was wrong. <laughs> so we made huge enlargements of our pictures in mm -hmm. color and sent one set to the Secretary of State, one set to General Abrams, and one set to Ambassador Bunker, saying that we had studied only one mission, but it was completely wrong. So Matt, you have some pictures? I do. <laughs> So we had a helicopter and we photographed forests that had been sprayed and that had not been sprayed. And there are basically two kinds of forests to oversimplify things. There are the mangrove forests, trees that grow in tidal areas, and the inland hardwood forests. It turns out that the mangrove forests were extremely sensitive to the herbicides. Here's a mangrove forest area that has not been sprayed. And if you can see this little dot here, that's a small boat which gives you an idea of the scale here. And this is a picture at about the same scale of a place that had been sprayed, and there are only a few trees that have survived. And then we went down on the ground to see what it looked like close up, and it looks like that. Hmm. But the inland forests, here's an inland forest area, beautiful Dipter carpaceae is the dominant tree uh, that has not been sprayed. And after spraying, the leaves fall off, but it takes many days for them to fall off. So it was clear the herbicides were indeed taking off leaves, and in the case of the mangroves, removing the whole cover. Uh, as I mentioned, General Abrams thought that the herbicides were generally useless. And we studied an area where there had been crop destruction, which looks like this. This is uh, about 15 kilometers total. And it's, you can see there's browning here. That's where cacodylic acid had been sprayed to kill the rice. I don't know if you can see this. But this is covered with little houses, little brass, little um, grass houses. We got back and we wrote this report. And we're told that as a result of it, that uh, General Abrams and Ambassador Bunker organized a complete review of the herbicide program. They recommended it be stopped. And within a few days, President Nixon stopped it. It was the end of the program. They're Man, I love, I love these stories about yellow rains. Well, I've been working, uh, I've been consulting at the CIA on other issues. And when we learned that there had been a, oh, some mysterious kind of deaths in Laos, uh, 
claimed by the refugees coming out of Laos to be chemical weapons, I was called and asked if I would consult. The claim was that there was yellow material, sticky droplets, that fell on people and caused them serious illness and even death. What year was this? Well, we first learned about it in 1976 in a cable that came from Bangkok to Washington. It was eventually claimed that chemical analysis revealed the presence of certain toxins made by fungi. But then there was an on-the-record press briefing by a man from the Army, a scientist, a lady from the Defense Intelligence Agency, and a man from the State Department. And they announced that all the samples they had of this yellow material were loaded with pollen grains. And the woman from the Defense Intelligence Agency, Sharon Watson, said, this is a clever communist method of making this stuff more effective because if it would fall on your skin, then it could poison you. But if it fell on a rock or a leaf and it dried out, the wind would blow the pollen grains into the air and you would inhale them and they would reach the alveoli of the lungs. By then I had got samples of this material myself and you could blow all day long at these. They were hard and crusty. But the question is, what were they? So I went down to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington with some samples of material that refugees had handed in and said was this poison. And Joan Nowicki, this pollen expert, identified the plant families in, this, in individual spots by electron microscopy. And she discovered, first of all, that the plants were all indigenous plant families, not from the north, like in Siberia, but from that very area of Southeast Asia. Second, no two spots were the same. They have different ratios of the different pollen families in them. Mm -hmm. Then I called a meeting. I invited people from the State Department and the British intelligence and uh, anthropologists and the uh, pollen experts and uh, bot botanists. What could these yellow spots be? All we knew was they had pollen, pollen from different plant families, but it must have something to do with bees. But what would they have to do with bees? And we, we couldn't decide at this meeting. But at the end of the meeting, Peter Ashton, who was a famous botanist now, um, said we should call Tom Seeley, an eminent bee scientist. And we told him there are these spots about a millimeter or so in diameter. They're filled with pollen grains and, other, and some other gooey materials. And we don't know what they are. And he said, and these were his words, the State Department explanation is not parsimonious. <laughs> it's bee shit. <laughs> That's Tom. That's his very uh, Tom humor. Now, bees, when they fly around, each bee will visit different flowers. Mm -hmm. And so it's likely that the feces from one bee are different from the feces of a different bee, mm -hmm. even in the same flight. So we got bees from Southeast Asia and squeezed them to get out samples of the bee feces and looked at that under the electron microscope. Anyway, it all matched. And then we did a lot more. I was teaching a course on war, and my teaching assistant at Harvard was the son of Al Haig, the Secretary of State and the aide to President Nixon. And Al Haig had by that time retired from Secretary of State. So his son, Brian, arranged I should meet his dad and show him my slides. So I did, and at the end of that, General Haig, he put his arm on me and he said, well, Matt, that's very impressive. But what they showed me when I was Secretary of State was also very impressive. And then he said something, I think, very important and interesting. He said, we are all in the hands of maniacs. Now, what did he mean? I think what he meant was that if you're the Secretary of State or the President, the people who are producing information are such a low level, you don't know any of these people. So it's very hard to know what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And the government's never admitted this. Still to this day, there is a long report, it's still highly classified. Anyway, a scientist can go out and do things that a government can't do, oddly enough, because we are so independent as individuals. And I've done three things like that, which I enjoyed also very much. One was the yellow rain, this. One was the herbicides. In and the third was there was a big outbreak of anthrax in the Soviet Union in 1979, in May, April and May. And I was, in that case, working in the CIA, living down there, as part of the review group. And the conclusion of the agency was that probably the Soviet explanation of this outbreak was wrong. Their explanation was 
the cattle and sheep had eaten, had, had eaten bad feed and the meat of these animals was contaminated with anthrax spores and people had eaten this meat and died of gastrointestinal anthrax. The CIA was worried that maybe it was aerosol borne from a facility that we knew from aerial photography and other sources was a secret military microbiological facility in the city of Sverdlovsk. So the question is, was it airborne or foodborne? That was the question. We had certain ways of knowing there had been cases for six whole weeks. Well, an airborne cloud should pass quickly. So I was unsure of the CIA conclusion. And Josh Lederberg, who was much closer to the agency, he was in a very high position as an advisor, agreed with me. So I wrote to uh, certain people in the Soviet Union, could I bring a team and go and look? And the answer was no, after some hesitation, but always no. Anyway, when Yeltsin came in, it was yes. So I brought a team to Sverdlovsk, and here's what we did. We got a list of the people who had died and where they lived at that time. And my wife, Jean, who is an anthropologist, together with two Russian professors, women, who uh, spoke English, went house to house and asked many questions. And one of the questions was, where did this person who died work? Or were they a pensioner at home? Where were they likely to be at night? So this allowed us to make maps of the probable location of each of these people in the daytime and the probable location in the nighttime. This is a satellite photograph of the southern part of the city only. And these red dots are where people were likely to have been in the daytime. So all these dots are the people who worked in a big factory here. These dots are people who were in a, a motorized rifle division military base. These dots are people who are in this secret biological facility. And most of these other dots are people who are at home because they're pensioners. But notice that most of them are in a very narrow zone. And then we got reports of where sheep and cows had died and plotted them on a map. And they all fall in a straight line. And that line is an extension of the line of where people live who died. And we then had data on the wind. And there was only one day when the wind was in that direction all day long. And it was Monday, April 2nd, 1979. <laughs> so we could prove, this, this is really very unusually solid epidemiological evidence. Meat does not travel with the wind in straight lines, but sp airborne spores do. So very, very clearly, the CIA was really confirmed. Mm -hmm. We confirmed it. And the Soviet explanation is wrong. Amazing. And we published this in Science Magazine. Have they shut down all their no, we still facilities? Have not, no, this facility still exists. They claim they're doing only defensive work there. There's now a treaty. I think it should be inspected, but there's no treaty that gives us inspection provisions. And now our relationships with them are not good enough. What does defensive work with anthrax mean? Vaccines, but at that time, maybe they were making uh, weapons. So Matt, the conversation just makes me wonder again, things I've wondered in the past, uh, what kind of background would produce a person who could do what you do? I mean, most of us, if we get involved in political things, um, certainly don't have the patience or the, the ability to do what you do. So it's very unusual. How do you explain it? I don't know. I could say some things that just occur to my mind. Just I remember that when the war broke out, that is when Germany invaded Poland, and by treaty, Britain was obligated then to enter the a war, and so was France. I heard this on the radio. I was nine years old. And my response was to go down into the basement of our house, which was not concrete, just dirt. And I dug a shelter, because in my youthful mind, I thought maybe the war will come to Los Angeles. So I remember being really gripped by the war news as it would come every day. And by the time I'd finished three years at the University of Chicago, I wanted to get into the Soviet Union because during the war they were our great allies. And now by 1949 they are enemies. And I wanted to know what's the truth I'd like to see for myself. What did you expect you would see? I thought that when I got there maybe I'd see people all subjugated and miserable or maybe I'd see happy, go I don't know, I just wanted to see. So I went to the Soviet Embassy in Paris and said I would like to go to the Soviet Union. They said, you need to be invited. 
and I don't know anyone there. So they said, well, why don't you go to Hungary? It's newly become communist. And maybe the Soviet embassy there, it's closer to Russia. Somehow they could get you in. So I went to Budapest. I went to the American embassy to see what was their perspective on what was happening in Hungary. And they told me that a law had just been passed making it illegal to listen to the BBC, mm -hmm. the British Broadcasting Corporation. I was living at the time with a Hungarian family. They had somehow survived the war. They were Jewish and they were communists. And everybody is very downcast because this meant for them it could either be the enlightened socialist communism they had hoped for or something else. And they eventually left in 1956. During this time in Budapest, there was a big exhibit. And this was an exhibit to show I that see. the Americans weren't as good as the Soviets yeah. when it comes to education. And it was fabricated in a way because by leaving out the state expenditures, yeah. it made it look like we spent almost nothing on education. So things like that kept happening. So I never really uh, trusted the communists. But I was very aware there shouldn't be a war. So I think that I came out with the view that uh, these guys are pretty bad in many ways, but a war would be the worst possible outcome. And so when so, I saw a mm. chance to somehow deal with these issues myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I, I would like to do it. So were your parents political? Not at all. My mother was completely apolitical, and my dad was fiercely patriotic. And when, when I was two, they moved. Well, first my father came from Denver to find a job, leaving my mother and me back in Denver. Then he got a job with an insurance company, which he didn't like, but we came out. And we lived in Hollywood, California. My mother came from a big family in one of the houses. They lived in all the uncles and aunts and all the cousins, living together in one big house. And I remember, they, in those days you could buy sugar, maybe even now, or flour in cloth bags with dotted lines where you should cut to make a dress or a shirt and they made clothing out of those yeah. sacks. And my job when I was a little kid, one of my jobs, one of my uncles smoked cigarettes and I was supposed to walk along Hollywood Boulevard and pick up the cigarette butts. And then he would open them up, take out the tobacco and roll new cigarettes <laughs> so he could smoke. Huh. So was it just the standard, or was it the usual Jewish family thing? They expected we great things orthodox. of you? They never said it, but it was obvious. But when I bring home my report card, even if it was all A's, my father would say, let's say I came with all A's. Is that the best you can do? <laughs> so I got the message. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I had an uncle who maybe had gone to a year or two in college, I'm not sure. But he was an amateur geologist, zoologist. He, he, he made me a chemistry set when I was very young in a cardboard box with magnesium ribbon and sulfur and I don't know what hmm. else. Uh, I had a big laboratory by the time I was 11. Was that just something spontaneous that you did or something? It or? began as something spontaneous, but then when I was in high school, I had a wonderful high school teacher and she knew a retired professor of chemistry from the University of Chicago, Herbert Newby McCoy, and his eyesight was going bad. So he needed someone to come once a week on Sunday to read for him the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And I would get, I think, a quarter, 25 cents an hour for that. But he was a rare earth chemist, and he still had in the attic of his garage a little laboratory and a very good spectrometer, quartz prism and all that. Mm -hmm. And I, he got me interested in rare earth chemicals. Mm -hmm. And I started to fractionally crystallize and purify samarium and neodymium and praseodymium. And I sold the oxides pure oxides of each of these three elements to a company in New York. And with the money, I'd buy new equipment like a furnace or a better spectrometer and stuff like that. So I had quite a big lab by the time I left and went to the University of Chicago. I was 16, but I had a big lab by then. You know. That's just uh, amazing to me. Okay, so during the war, it was not common that people would want to goof off in the summers. There's a war on do something yeah. useful. Yeah. So one summer I worked in a defense factory, which made plastic enclosures for airplanes. And the next summer I went to Hollywood High School and took a bunch of courses, math and other things. And so that next September, I went to John Marshall High School and said, I'd like now to have my high school diploma. And the registrar there said, well, you, by law, you have to have three full years of physical education. You had only two. So I said, well, what do I do? Just take PE for a whole year? She said, no, were there any courses you liked? I said, yeah, I liked some, chemistry. 
She said, well, take him again. And suddenly it appeared that the adults didn't know anything. They had this idiot proposal for how I should spend my life. So I started asking, what can I do? And a distant relative said, there's a place called the University of Chicago that will take you without a high school diploma. So I applied, and I convinced my parents to let me go. I was 16. Horace Judson was one lived in the same dormitory. Wow. He was 15, and there were other really great Maybe roommates. you should just mention who Horace is. Horace Judson has written The Ace Day of Creation, the most sophisticated, deep history of the origins of molecular biology. And if he hadn't written it then when he could interview all the main players, nobody could do it today. It is a great book mm -hmm. uh, with a social context, the science almost perfectly understood. Oh, absolutely. When I got to Chicago, I found you cannot study chemistry and physics and math. Hutchins, the chancellor, had abolished the bachelor's degree in individual subjects like chemistry. It was the great books program, mm -hmm. which I had never anticipated. But in retrospect, I'm very glad. So I took three years of that, and I read things, the classics. Mm -hmm. But what I got a bachelor's degree in was called Bachelor of Philosophy. <laughs> anyway, by this point, I was kind of confused because I learned all these other things, and I wondered if I could become a psychoanalyst, and not applied to individual human patients, but to whole nations, mm -hmm. and somehow give therapy to nations in some way. I had no idea how to do this, so there wouldn't be wars. And I went to Paris, to France, both to see if I could see the Soviet Union, so I could travel with my friend, and so I could figure out what to do with my life. I realized that if I were to go into any of these social sciences, at the end of my life, I would have no idea of whether anything I had done was right. Because in social science, in my opinion, mm -hmm. at least then, you never know. Mm -hmm. But in chemistry, at least you know. But you hadn't studied chemistry for three or four years, if I understand Not this. Not in those three years. So now I had to go to school and be a freshman all over again. So I went to Caltech. So it was just, I was a freshman in chemistry. Oh. But I didn't like Caltech because the teaching was rote, except for Pauling's course in chemistry, general chemistry. But I got to know Linus, and I got to know two of his children, Peter and Linda. And then I left Caltech, and so I went back to the University of Chicago. And there I took courses, so I got a letter. What letter kind said, of courses did you take at that point? Vector analysis, atomic oh, physics. Oh, so these are graduate courses. Yeah, physical chemistry. and so in general chemistry from Schlesinger. And I got a letter from a dean whose name was Parsons. And it said, the University of Chicago does not give the bachelor's degree in chemistry. But if we did, we would give one to Matthew Messelson. Well, why didn't... Anyway, so with this letter, I got to be a graduate student in physics in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I was really jumping around all over. My poor parents must have thought I'm going to end up on the streets. But I was looking for a way into biology by this time, but via chemistry and physics. Mm -hmm. So I'm in Berkeley in a thing called biophysics, but it's in the physics department. But a very nice guy there named John Goffman said, you don't belong here. You should go and be Linus Pauling's student. But I thought, no, no, I'd never, he'd never take me. So I decided I'm going to go back to the University of Chicago. <laughs> they had a program called Mathematical Biophysics. But I had known by this time Linda and Peter Pauling. And that summer, Linda, or maybe Peter, had a party, a daytime party, at their daddy's house. And I'm in the swimming pool, and out comes the world's greatest chemist with a necktie and a vest and a jacket. And I'm practically naked down in the water. But I knew him, or he knew me, because I had done a research project when I was a freshman that one year uh, on hemoglobin with Harvey Itano. Hmm. And, uh, so he looked down at me and said, well, Matt, what are you going to do next year? And I said, I'm going to the University of Chicago to mathematical biophysics. And here I can remember what he said. He said, but Matt, that's a lot of baloney. Why don't you come and be my graduate student? And I looked up and I said, OK. <laughs> and so that's how I became Linus Pauling's graduate student. Is there anything that strikes you about science then versus science now? And I know, I know. You and I, I yeah. were in, in at the beginning of a whole new science, a whole, a whole new way of doing biology. And of course, if it's confined to a small number of people, and if the initial people are of that frame of mind that wants openness and criticism, uh, you get a special kind of attitude. Max Delbruck, Luria, Hershey, 
those guys had this attitude and they propagated it and attracted people of like mind. So the characteristics were it was completely open. There was a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of communication, a lot of shooting down other people's ideas, hoping that they might criticize yours. A lot of communication. Um, it was a wonderful time. And also there was a kind of feeling that we are evangelists. All the other biologists mm. uh, ha have not been clued in. And it's mm. our mission. We're going to clue them in. This took an extreme form at Caltech. Max felt that anybody who works with anything bigger than a phage is wasting their time, <laughs> even an E. coli, too big, yeah. let alone a yeast, my yeah, goodness, my God. Yeah. let alone a corn or a fly. Mm. And uh, so it was actually, it was a big step for Frank and me to drop phage T4 for density gradient studies, which would have been a disaster to use mm. that, and go to bacteria. Melvin Cohn, who's at uh, the Salk Institute, mm -hmm has written a paper about what it was like to do research back then, which is a marvelous paper. It is different now. First of all, there are a lot more people. So they can't all know each other, right? There are too many. The big meeting, it used to be little meetings where you could really talk to people. Now there's thousands of people who go to some of these meetings. The next thing is that it has become of relevance to medicine. When people were doing uh, gene conversion and uh, Phage genetics, there's nothing medical there. Mm -hmm. So there was no question of patenting anything. Mm -hmm. It's a different attitude now mm -hmm. because of all these things. Also for another reason, basically I would say, maybe I'm wrong, that all the major big problems, except a few, were solved by 1970. Mm -hmm. RNAi was a big surprise. There are a few other big surprises, but basically, how the, what are genes made of? How do they multi, how do they replicate? How do they recombine? And I have to say this: imagine the DNA double helix. If you look at the DNA molecule, it says, "Look at me. I'm a gene." In other words, it was a dictator. It stood there mm -hmm. and told you what to do. Mm -hmm. So the tribe of people who were the subjects of this dictator, this Wizard of Oz, except this is no fraud. It's the real McCoy. It's a special feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, thanks very much for taking this time. It's been fantastically Thank interesting you. for me, and I think a lot of people will be very interested. Well, you and I have been very lucky. <laughs>